10 principles of uh, how to overcome stubborn habits or sinful habits, uh, basically how to have victory over sin. So uh, again, this material is not original with me, put up by an organization called Reformers Unanimous, based out of Rockford, Illinois. And it's just basic Bible principles, Bible teaching with regard to how to have victory over sin. Uh, the, the wording in their, in their material is, is how, to, you know, how to overcome uh, stubborn habits or sinful habits. Um, so just a review, uh, we were only, there's 10 of them, we were only able to get through 6 of them last week, so we got 4 this week. Uh, first one was, if God's against it, so am I. So in order for you to be able to have victory over anything with regard to a stubborn habit, sinful habit, uh, you have to first adopt God's attitude towards it, and that if God's against it, then you know I have to be as well. Um, second one would have been, every sin has its origin in our hearts. And yes, we have the world and we have Satan. And obviously, like, well, our, our, our flesh would be uh, ourselves, but uh, you have external temptation. But ultimately, the fact is, uh, we saw in James that uh, every man uh, is drawn away when he's enticed uh, by, by his own lust. And so the thing is, when lust I conceive, we bring forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bring forth death. And your, your sin, the one that you go after, the one you give yourself into, is because of your heart, your heart's wicked desire. Uh, the heart's deceitful above all things, and it's desperately wicked. Um, and the thing is, only God can know it. Only God's able to give us victory um, over that. Okay, and then principle three would have been, it is easier to keep the heart clean than it is to clean it after it has been defiled. It's easier to keep it clean than to clean it after it has been defiled. So the idea there is basically that you are better off setting up safeguards and putting yourself in a position where you avoid going into sin. Uh, good morning. We're in Romans 14. We're just quickly reviewing the first uh, six principles that we went over last week. Uh, so you're, you're better off putting up safeguards and putting yourself in a position where you avoid going into sin rather than, you know, being careless and then uh, getting involved in the next thing you know, oh, i got a big mess to clean up now and i got to deal with all the, all the repercussions of that. And we'll, well, actually, the principle seven, we're going to be looking at that now deals something with that. Okay, and then all uh, principle four is impossible to fight a fleshly appetite by indulging in it. Okay, so if it's something that has uh, detrimental effects to you, uh, the fact is you're not you're not going to get victory over it if you're just giving into it constantly. Uh, you got you have to fight it. You have to put up safeguards for yourself, and then uh, set up a, a system to where you don't you don't give into it. Okay, uh, principle five, small compromises lead to great disasters. In other words, little sins lead to big sins. So usually you don't end up in a big mess uh, just out of the blue. There's little things that you do lead, that lead you to end up being in a big mess in your life. And then principle six was those who do not love the Lord will not help us serve the Lord. Okay, those who do not love the Lord will not help us serve the Lord. And we saw that Paul spoke of that in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, speaking of that uh, we're supposed to withdraw from those that uh, call themselves brethren but still are given over to fornication or to idolatry and those kinds of things because the fact is if, uh, well the Bible teaches also earlier in uh, Book A was that uh, can, two walk agree, can two walk together except they be agreed. The fact is if you're going in a certain direction somebody else is not, uh, it may not be that they may not, you know, are uh, and, uh, like purposefully trying to bring it down, but they will bring it down. And you're not going to have victory if you're given. If you're around folks that still indulge in that thing and don't have that same mindset or attitude that God has towards towards your sin. Uh, so starting out today, we're in Romans 14, and principle 7 is 
Our sinful habits do hurt those that follow us. Okay, our sinful habits do hurt those that follow us. Uh, Romans 14. We'll start at verse 1 just to establish the context. It's going to be verse 7 that we're looking at. But verse four, we'll start at verse 1 just to establish the context. Okay. He that, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Okay, let him not, uh, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Okay, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be upholden. Uh, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Okay, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be uh, fully persuaded in his own mind. And then he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day uh, to the Lord, he doth not regard it. Um, he that eateth, eateth to the Lord. He that giveth thanks, uh, for he for he giveth thanks, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not uh, to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us live unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Okay. So in context, what he's talking about is he's writing to the church at Rome, and he's been addressing a number of different issues. In particular here, he's regarding uh, something that would seem uh, what actually just pastor preach on this uh, Wednesday night with regarding meat offered unto idols uh, and that was that you have um, we don't really see this necessarily in our culture here in the US but they would have had pagan temples that they worship uh, basically it's demon worship is what they did but they you know they had these statues and whatever else was involved in that but they offered actual like food to an idol you might see some of that if you go to more traditional like Chinese restaurant and sometimes they have like a little Buddha statue and then they'll have, you know, like a little plate of food, maybe a, a, a drink next to it that they offer to, uh, to, to that thing. It's, you know, it's an inanimate object. Uh, it's a you know, piece of uh, porcelain usually that they coated with, with paint, uh, maybe even with a precious metal or something like that. But um, that is what they would do. And then what would happen is, is that after the fact, I mean, it's still food, you know, that thing doesn't get to come alive and eat it. So what they did is like, okay, we can sell it for a profit just a little bit cheaper because it was offered, you know, to, it, it's already been, I guess you could say, used. So it's uh, it's kind of like when you go to, uh, well, <laughs> we don't have that very much around in these parts, but like when I lived in the Carolinas, uh, the secondhand uh, grocery store. So you would have uh, almost expired, like bread, uh, day old bread or stuff like that that would normally like a regular store would be thrown out but you can you can sell it second hand uh, and canned goods and stuff like that and it was like really really cheap to go ahead and get your groceries there so in that sense as far as the, okay let's make a profit and you had people that came out from a pagan worship background that got born again and then they see that and it's like oh wait a minute you know that's uh, that's wicked you know how can you eat that you got the other person um, this is you know this is that's that idol is not really a thing. In other words, it doesn't. There's no. Um, it's it's not really a living being, you know. It has an association to demonism, but the fact is that that food is still valid food, you know. It's not that idol is not a legitimate god, you know. God's the creator of both. Well, not not of the idol, but rather, you know, he's created of the materials that they, the men use to make the idol. Um, so here you have. It's the same kind of concept. So here you have one individual that believes it's okay to eat meat, uh, and then you have another one that says, okay, hey, look, it's not good for you, it's not healthy, so he'd rather eat herbs. And then now you have, uh, typically what you see is kind of disagreement. You got one person looking down on the other. Uh, you got the one that eats meat, says, hey, man, what's wrong with you? You know, why are you not eating meat? Why is it okay? You know, it's, that's foolish. You're, the way, the way you're living, the way you're thinking about uh, eating meat is foolish. And then you got the other person uh, from the other perspective saying, okay, hey, look, this is, <laughs> you're wicked. How can you eat meat? You know, this, it's wrong for you. It's, it's, uh, it's bad for your health and whatever other arguments he wants to put forth. So Apostle Paul is basically saying, hey, look, 
if you're doing it unto the Lord, if it's a conscious thing before the Lord, um, Apostle Paul's stand on it was basically, if, if it offends my brother to eat meat, I, I, I'm not going to eat meat till, you know, basically until Jesus returns, until I, till I die. Um, but let him, and then he was uh, basically the one that eats meat, don't look down on the person that doesn't, and then the one that doesn't, don't, don't judge the other person that does eat. Because uh, first off, you're not God. Uh, that person rises and falls to God, uh, and so you're not you're not their judge. You can't really do anything with regard to that. And so you have one person here that says he regards the day as unto the Lord, and then you got another person that doesn't regard the day as unto the Lord. Um, and then he, he mentions here verse seven. It says, "For none of us liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself." Okay. So the thing is, your life has an effect on other people. Uh, whether you realize that or not, uh, whether you actually even think that you have any some me any measure of influence in other people's lives, you actually do according to God, according to God's word. You have a sphere of influence, whether you re recognize that or not, but you do. The fact is, you were created uh, to glorify God and to impact people's lives for God to draw them close to Him. Um, that's God's plan. That's God's heart. And so, if now applied to overcoming sinful habits um, if I am living my life as it's unto me then I'm not going to regard what I say, what I do, where I go and so forth so that what I want and you know uh, what my flesh desires is going to be what's controlling me, dictating me and I am going to dishearten brethren uh, with my walk that is careless. Okay? Uh, sinful habits, the fact is, you encourage people to either uh, go, you know, either along with you or whatever sinful habits that they might have in their life that maybe, you, you know, you know nothing about. But the fact is, it would say to them, hey, well, if they do that, that means I'm, I'm free to go ahead and do, you know, I know it seems like a silly argument, but the fact is there are a lot of people that look for any kind of excuse to want to go ahead and indulge into sin, uh, whatever that sin may be. And the fact is, the fact, we, we don't live unto ourselves, we don't die unto ourselves. And then also Apostle Paul wrote to church at Corinth that our body is not our own, okay? Uh, I know it seems like a weird concept, but the fact is uh, our body is our <coughs> God. When we... Uh, receive Christ as our Savior when we get born again. Uh, we're not only given the Holy Spirit and we have eternal life and we have, yeah, a home in heaven waiting for us. We have an in, uh, inheritance incorruptible and the Father faith is not away and a great under, number of promises, but the Bible says that we're bought with a price and we're obligated to glorify God in our body and our spirits because now really in a sense that, that in reality is that they're God's now. Um, it's, it's not even mine anymore. The time that I have the, the talents that I have, uh, anything that I can account for in my life really belongs to God. And I'm obligated uh, because of the grace of God in my life shown me to be able to, to do with it what God wants. So in, in effect, it's God saying, here, I'm allowing you whatever space of time he has for your life. If it's 50 years, here, I'm giving you this slice of 50 years to be able to do uh, what I'm telling you to do. So that when we stand before Him, uh, when we give account for our lives to Him, uh, we, you know we can either hear "Well done," or you know we can stand there ashamed. <laughs> and I, I don't want to be one that stands ashamed. Uh, I, I don't think any, honestly, I don't think anybody, if they're clearly thinking, would want to stand before God ashamed with regard to that. You know, having, you know, having wasted life uh, given so that you can glorify Him. So our our sinful habits do hurt those that follow us. Okay, principle eight. Okay, it is not possible to fight a fleshly temptation with fleshly weapons. It's not possible to fight fleshly temptation with fleshly weapons. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Okay. 
uh, we'll start at verse 1 just to establish context. It says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Uh, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Okay, for we for though we walk in the flesh, we do not, we do not war after the flesh. And here's the reason why they don't war um, against the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and then casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and then having a ready and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Right, so he's writing to them. He's actually, this is kind of sad, because he wrote to them initially to address a number of things that were going on that they had a lot of issues with. Now, they corrected some of that, but they still had like kind of like an issue, a contention with Apostle Paul. That's the sad part as far as they're responsible um, that, in other words, they, they, they came to know God by, by means of Apostle Paul coming to them and preaching the gospel to them. Uh, he spent close to two years with them teaching about the word of God, teaching uh, you know, Christ, and then teaching um, just everything whatsoever had been commanded to him. And what God was, was revealing to him was with regard to the church and a number of other different things. Uh, he writes to them uh, initially because of different issues that they had. They had... Uh, Basically, it's uh, respect to persons that, you know, they looked at one person as being all oh, better than another kind of thing. And so there was divisions among them. They had uh, fornication going on into church. Uh, they were eating, um, well, not just the meat offering unto idol, but and then they also had the whole uh, thing about spiritual gifts where they were confused on that and they were working that in the flesh. So now he's writing to them with regard to things that they corrected and kind of admonishing them also and then addressing some other things that they had uh, issues with. Here in chapter 10, uh, he's basically, his approach is trying to be a little bit more gentle. He's coming out to them and saying, hey, look, <laughs> I don't want to have to, you know, you guys know better. I've, I've shown you better. You guys know better because of also what the Word of God teaches. I don't want to have to be somebody that is like in your face, basically, when I come to you in person. You know, I can... If, if you take heed to what I write to you, then when we come and then we can have the fellowship. Uh, in other words, we, you know, you, if you guys are in sin, I have to deal with that because uh, you can't just let sin go wild. You know, you shouldn't be in sin. You're called uh, if because they've been born again. It, uh, good morning, Second uh, Corinthians chapter ten. Second Corinthians chapter ten. Um, if sin's going on rampant, then the thing is it has to be dealt with. But you guys know better. You ought to be able to go ahead and take care of that. And so. But he also, he mentioned something here kind of seems like in passing, but within context, and that is that uh, weapons of our warfare. Now, what warfare, I, I know it, it, it's like, okay, what does it have to do? What warfare do we have? What, what's, what's this warfare that he's talking about? What is it? What the... Uh, Spiritual. Yeah. He, we see this, and he writes to the church at Ephesus. We'll, we'll look at that passage next. But there's... A fight that goes on. Now, a person that's been born again, uh, they've been bought with a price, and they're adopted into God's family. You have uh, not just eternal home in heaven waiting for you. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But now, also, you have uh, an enemy. Uh, it's not like he was your friend before, honestly, but <laughs> he's a lot more against you now uh, than we, I would say maybe than we might have would have been before. And that is, you have the Satan that he wants to destroy your life. Uh, fact is, once you've trusted Christ as Savior, uh, you don't have to worry about your soul because God promises that uh, those that come to him, he, he will in no wise cast out. And so I think once you receive Christ as your Savior, uh, your soul, as far as where you're gonna go when you pass, that's settled. That's taken care of at that point. Uh, so he can't take you to hell with him. So what he wants to do is he wants to make as much ruin of your life because he knows a few things and that is that God has placed his name on you and he wants to transform you. The Bible says that we're predestined to be conformant to the image of his son. Okay, and that's everybody, male and female. 
anybody that believes on Christ, God wants to transform who you are as a person and your character and all that so that you reflect Christ, so that you're as much like Jesus, uh, obviously, obviously as Jesus was, and also so that we have fulfill our original purpose for which we were created. If we were to go back to Genesis, we see that when God created everything, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament will show in His handiwork, right? So the thing is, we're, we're, we're created to glorify God. The idea of glorify basically is that you represent accurately for who He is. So as much as, even though you can look at the stars or creation overall, a lot of it's been damaged by sin, I'd still, you can't but look and say if you're honest, wow, okay, you know, God's immense, God's uh, incredible. You just, it's kind of like your jaw drops as far as like, you can't even begin to think as far as how, how you know, big God is, how strong and all these things, right? And so the thing is, that's how our life should be with regard to like who God is. In other words, when people interact with us, uh, they, Bible says of us, you know, Bible says of God that he's a spirit, uh, right? So you can't obviously see him yet with our eyes. Um, we will one day when we when she'll be like him. And also, um, Bible says that without faith is impossible to please him. So God hides himself, and faith is without sight, right? Uh, hides himself. In other words, he, he works on that premise of faith, which is not by sight, on purpose. Okay, but he would have that we, his representatives, would accurately represent him and so people ought to be able to know what God is like how loving he is how gracious he is how holy he is and all the other attributes about who God is by their interaction with other Christians no matter how long you've been saved and such because that's what God wants and that's how we're supposed to be with regard to um, so okay we have an enemy wanted to do away with as much of that as possible and how does he do that is he starts putting negative thoughts, you know, creepy thoughts, having people come and uh, overtly try and oppose you, um, you know, you got temptation from sin, uh, and all kinds of things. And so it's not, you, you're in a warfare in a sense now, now you're on God's team and then you got your, you have to fight the devil. Um, and mind you, the people that worship the devil, the people that actually give themselves over to him, they're not the enemy. <laughs> and that seems crazy, right? But the fact is, God wants to win them too. You know, if they're still alive, they still have breath in their heart, or breath in their, you know, breath in their soul. They have breath in their body. The fact is, God wants to rescue them. He's not only the enemy should perish, but also come to repentance. Yeah. Um, so we, we we should pray for them. But it says, weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, so God's weaponry is not <coughs> on a physical basis. Okay, we spite, but we fight on a, on a spiritual basis and, there, and it's mighty okay we're able to have victory over sin we're able to go ahead and have uh, you know victory over whatever stubborn habits that we find ourselves uh, involved in and feeling in bondage to uh, he says a means by which we do that here is in verse 5 casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ now, I want, to look, I want to look at the wording here, okay? Casting down and then bringing into captivity. Casting down and bringing into captivity, okay? Who does that? Oh, you hear that? You do. God gives Both you right. Power. Okay. God gives you the power for His Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that really is, he's a divine enabler. Okay, we need God's grace. We cry out to God for grace to help in time of need, and he gives it. So he enables us he, with supernatural strength. But we have to make a choice. In other words, we have to actively say, no, I need to put measures in place in my life so that when things start to pop up, all right, <laughs> um, I'm not very computer savvy, but this is one of the few things I do remember as far as when I was first learning. Uh, we had a class, in, well, it was in junior high, and there was a term, uh, I know this is like really old, it played out, but it's okay. It's called garbage in, garbage out, okay? The, what, you, what, what, what ends up coming out is 
whatever the programmer or whatever um, whatever uh, had been put in. Okay, so if only thing coming in is trash or garbage, that's the only thing that's going to be coming out. Uh, what you let influence your mind through what you listen to, uh, what you read, um, and, and those things, uh, what you what you let your mind dwell on, that's going to affect you. And so um, those imaginations, once they're identified as, hey, look, this is against God. This is against, I, I don't need that in my life. I don't, I don't have. You put up a safeguard against that and block that out. Now you, it's. Holy Spirit's enabling that allows you, but you have to make a choice to say, hey, look, no. <laughs> I'm not letting that come in. I'm not letting that influence me. I'm not letting that be what's going to rule or affect me in my attitude and my disposition with regard to walking and living for Christ. Go to uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, verse 10. Okay, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Okay, not in my might, but in His might. And then put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he's going to Describe the armor for wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now this is interesting. Before we get into the description, well, I don't even know that. We, well, okay. Well, before we get into the description, here, look at the wording here. He says, um, "Put on the whole armor that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil." Right? I, I ask real silly. I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence or anything like that. Okay, but. Is the devil weaker than you or stronger than you? Stronger, stronger. Yeah, of course, okay. And so, are demons weaker than you or stronger than you? Stronger. Yeah, they're a whole lot stronger. Okay, they're not to be trifled with, they're nothing to be played with. Okay, the forces of darkness, the forces of evil. And the fact is, is sin stronger than me? Yeah, it doesn't matter what the sin is. <laughs> I'm free from it, I don't have to obey it any longer, you know? Uh, sin's no longer my taskmaster. Jesus is. But sin is, is nothing to be played with. Okay? It's like playing with fire. You're going to get burned. Okay? It doesn't matter what the sin is. The fact is sin will burn you. It will do a lot of damage and destruction in your life. Okay? You're, we need to recognize the fact is, okay, I'm weak, but I'm strong in Christ. And that, that's where he says here, uh, to put on the whole armor of God. And he says, be strong. But he says, be strong in the Lord. Okay, and in the power of His might. Okay, God is creator and sustainer of everything. And the fact is, it's, it's His power that is able to enable me, or that enables me to be able to have victory. The only reason why I would have any freedom from sin is because of what Christ did, because God gave it to me. You know, and so I need to seek Him. I need to rely on Him. He's the one. I need to be dependent upon Him in order for me to be able to have any kind of victory, whatever, uh, whatsoever. And then, uh, and then He reemphasizes in verse thirteen. He says, "Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God." And He says, "That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand." Um, that's defensive measure. In other words, God has me we're on the offensive as church as far as regarding reaching out to the lost seeing you know uh righteousness rot within this world uh but the fact is the devil's not just going to sit by idly he wants to you know attack and he wants to destroy he wants to ruin people's lives um and he's going to do it by any means possible uh he's he doesn't have a rule book as far as you know there's there's nothing um, there's nothing restraining him as far as how low he'll go to be able to ruin somebody's life or to take them to hell. Um, well, for, for those of us that are born again, he can't take us to hell, so he, whatever, however much of our lives he can ruin or destroy, 
uh, through his influence in it, uh, that as, as much as we would allow. And then uh, the only way for us to be able to withstand his attack, the idea there is that, okay, we're being barraged. Uh, the only means by which I'm able to withstand and then having exerted all, having done all, that I'll be able to be somebody that's standing and not just be floored is because I'm with God's armor standing in his mouth, in his power, uh, you know, strengthened with his might. And so that, that's me depending on God. And then we look at the armor here as far as he tells us with regard to that. This is, you know, this is, this is the <coughs> armor, you know, having a Lord's gourd about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now whose righteousness is that? That's God's righteousness, not mine. <laughs> My righteousness is his filthy rags. And the fact is we have God's righteousness imputed into us whenever we receive Christ. Um, and then your feet shot with preparation of the gospel of peace. And then taking the shield of faith where we're, uh, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay? And that is not only just obviously you being faithful, but the fact is is me believing God. You're going to have periods in your life where you're going to be attacked and you're going to feel like Job, where he looks to the left, he looks to the right, he looks above, he looks beneath, and he's like, okay, where's God? It seems like I'm all alone. But he said something with regard to God, because he was resting in his character. He says, you know, um, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You know, I can't see him, I can't sense him, I can't feel him, but I know God means the best for me because God is good. That's a foundational truth. And so if God is good, he's only going to do good, and he wants good for my life. And so I need to rest in, 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 in the truth of God's word and believing uh, with regard to uh, just, you know, God's, God's truth. Uh, take on, uh, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, the only offensive weapon here, uh, which is the word of God. Okay, this is how I am going to be able to uh, defeat Satan, among other things. And then this isn't looked upon uh, uh, quite often, but verse 18, praying always. Prayer is another way as far as being able to, that's you calling out to God, uh, asking God. And he's, he, you know, he tells us in Hebrews 4 uh, that uh, let us come boldly into the throne of grace that we may uh, take grace and find help, in, uh, find grace to help in time of need. In other words, I, when I, I have God's power in heaven at my disposal. Why? Not because I'm some great person, but the fact is because that's what God has afforded. And that, that's the kind of God of who He is. And um, it's the Word of God that's going to be able to keep me. Uh, David encouraged himself in the Lord whenever he was at a very, very, very low point uh, in his life. And we can as well. Uh, so this is what we need. Okay, This is not uh, me being some Superman. This is me relying on God and then using what is at my disposal that he's allotted to me so that I can fight fleshly temptation uh, with spiritual weapons and have victory and come out on the other side and be like, wow, okay, hey, how <laughs> do you give in? I don't have ruin in my life because of this at this point. You know, I can go forward and be victorious and be joyful and be rejoicing and glorify God uh, because of that. Okay, principle nine. We lose our freedom to choose when we give in to temptation. Our consequences are inevitable and incalculable and up to God. Okay? We lose our freedom to choose when we give in to temptation. Now here's the, the idea behind that. Okay, we what <coughs> your freedom to choose what? I agree. When you give well we, okay, you got temptation of in Proverbs, we're told that uh, the prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, uh, but the simple pass on and basically are destroyed. So, sin is destructive in a person's life. When you choose to say, oh, I'll give in to that this time, it's not that big a deal, or whatever, whatever your thought process is with regard to when you give in to that temptation to sin and you actually go in and sin, here's the thing. You can't choose the consequences of it, all right? You can't choose, you don't know how far reaching that's gonna be. You don't know how many people that's gonna affect. You don't know how bad it's gonna do damage in your life. You know, you don't know that's gonna be the last thing that you end up doing. They're like, oh wow, I didn't expect this to happen. Uh, you, don't, you don't have that. And by the way, this isn't like 
you know, God is like, oh, I got you now. Rather, it's, hey, that's, that's the natural outcurring effects. Before you even get to an issue as far as, you know, God wanting to judge or anything like that, this is just, that's the way sin works. It ruins and destroys lives. And so the thing is, you lose the freedom to choose. You choose what? You can't choose your consequences. The fact is, that's... Say again? Choose life. Yeah, you want to choose life. And that's by avoiding <coughs> avoiding going into sin. To avoid that temptation. When that temptation comes calling, you want to cry out to God. God, help me. <laughs> you know, use the, the resources he has given to you. <coughs> to, be able to go ahead and say, no, hey, I can't do that. <coughs> Don't wait, forget this, you know. Or if even just like Joseph, run. Uh, whatever you got to do, get away, you know. Uh, Proverbs 20, Proverbs 20. Verse 17. Okay, verse 17. Okay, bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. Okay, bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. Now, I know it seems kind of like, okay, well, what's up with this? Uh, you know, who's eating gravel? Or at least who's had it in their mouth? You know, who's had... Is that something that's really tasty? You know, why, why would somebody want that? <laughs> yeah. I've had I've had it for a number of different reasons, but not not purposefully. And I was like, I fell into it riding a bike, and I was head first into it. So I was like, okay, when it, you know, just because of the way I felt and stuff like that. But it's not something that okay, you just kind of like up and say, oh wow, this is really delicious. Okay, but and again, that's the way sin works. It seems like, oh, wow, this is really amazing. And then the next thing you know, okay, boom, you got gravel in your mouth. Right? Now you're, this is, uh, what's up with this? And um, if, when we find ourselves in a position where we're in sin, again, the remedy to that is you confess it. You give it to God, and then you seek to do right from that point forward. Uh, but avoiding it altogether is, is a better option. And then verse, or excuse me, your uh, final principle. Okay, God balances guilt and blame. Accept the blame for your actions, and God will remove the guilt. Okay? Accept the blame for your actions, and God will remove the guilt. <coughs> and we go to 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9. We looked at this one. It's it's a really good verse for a lot of different applications. But we looked at this one as far as when we when we said if God's against us, oh my, because of the because of the word confession, okay. But God balances guilt and blame. Um, if we confess our sins, okay, he's, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Is the idea? Uh, I'm guilty, right? I've actually committed a crime before God. Uh, that's what my sin is. It's, it's a crime against God's law. I violated it, and so now I'm guilty. Um, your conscience will usually, depending on how damaged it is or whatever, the fact is you'll have a sense of, hey, man, I've done wrong. This is wrong. You know. And if you're broken before God, you're standing before God, and you're like, man, this feels uncomfortable. You know? You're afraid to want to come to him because you're like, man, I've done wrong. And you got to like, okay, i got to admit this before you. Uh, but the fact is, you have that cleansing and that forgiveness of that if you just admit to God, hey, this is sin. Okay, in other words, what he calls sin, the sin that he's called out in your life, uh, when we're real about it, God, this is sin. What you say about it is what it is. In other words, it's not... You know, some little thing. It's not uh, whatever else you want, whatever term you want to use as far as to say, you know, that it's not that big of a deal or that it's okay. You know, oh, you ought to be, you know, accepting, you know, you, you got to know where I come from and those kinds of things, right? Um, rather, it's like, hey, this is wicked. 
I deserve death because of it. You know, that's <coughs> you admit to God that He promises that He'll give cleansing for that. Now, I kind of understood in that is that you would be obviously repentant. In other words, you would have a change of mind with regard to what the sin is. And in other words, that's that's really where you get victory. In other words, when you <coughs> recognize sin for what it is. Um, Go to Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians seven. start at verse 9. Right? You'd have to go a little earlier to establish the context, but we'll start at verse 9. It says, Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, and sorrowful, that's the idea, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry or sorrowful after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Okay, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. Okay, so by the way, the idea of salvation or uh, godly sorrow work is... Uh, Uh, repentance of salvation. It's it's not it's not it's not talking about going to heaven. It's not, it's not talking about being saved from you know from eternal. But rather, salvation has been different contexts. Has do other words as, as, as does repentance. But in, in here in this particular, he's talking about basically it's to self it, to being rescued from the further damages of sin. All right here. So he's writing to the church of Corinth. And he's addressing the fact that they dealt with the guy that was having uh, sexual relations with his stepmom, basically. Okay, so he had his father's wife, and he was in fornication. And so they're like, "Hey, man, you guys are puffed up because you, you're not dealing with it." And then it's like, "Oh, it's not that big a deal, but that's not right before God." And so now they dealt with it, and he's like writing to them, saying, "Hey, look, I'm glad that you guys actually, after I wrote you guys, were sorrowful over the fact that." You know, you guys were in this sin and you were allowing it and, that's, and those kinds of things. But it was, he made a distinction here be, between a worldly sorrow and a godly sorrow, okay? A godly sorrow, a lot of times we look at when somebody points out sin in our life or we look at like when we get conviction from God and we get an attitude about it as if, who are you to point it out or who are you to, you know, say something about it or, you know, what, you know, and they get you get mad. But rather, um... And then worldly sorrow also has the effect of it that, like, people throw, like, a pity party, like there's no hope. But the fact is, uh, God says repeatedly in his word, uh, we saw this in the message last, it was actually one of my favorite verses in Revelation 3, that whom he loves, he rebukes and chastens, okay? So in other words, when God points out sin, he does it because he loves you. And actually, honestly, people that are with God, that are right with God, if they point out sin, uh, it's not pleasant <laughs> to hear that. But the fact is, if they're pointing it out, do you realize that God doesn't have to, He's not obligated to warn you before He does something? You know what? If He wanted to destroy you, couldn't He do it? Couldn't He just say, hey, boom, and then you'd be done? If you think about it, um, how many thieves give any kind of warning before they come in and break in and, and do something or steal something? No, right. I mean, why would they? So well, somebody, when somebody gives you a heads up about something, I know it's it, we don't think like this. This isn't human nature to think like this. But the fact is, you it, they're giving you a heads up because it's like, hey, they want you to change. They want you to do something about it. You deal with it, so then we don't have to. And that's that's what God's approach to it is. So when Hebrew he calls out, he points out, he gives conviction, sin, is so that we can deal with it, so that he doesn't have to. Because when when he deals with it, it's gonna be it's gonna be hard. You know, that's going to be very painful for us. And so the thing is, um, uh, anyway, so godly sorrow recognizes there's hope. I could do something about it, right? And the reason why is because foundationally really you've, God's good, okay? God loves me, <laughs> so I need to deal with this. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, all right, so, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll finish this up here. <laughs> We're dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.